Well, welcome back, everyone, to the reading of Brissinger. I nearly said Aragon. <laughs> We've already done that one. I believe this is part uh, 10, um, if I'm correct, because sometimes I forget which part I'm reading. Uh, we are jumping right back in with Aragon and Arya as they are heading back from Alagazia into the Vardens camp. So, with that, amid the restless crowd, it was mid-afternoon when the Varden finally came into sight. Aragon and Arya stopped on the crest of a low hill and studied the sprawling city of great tents that lay before them. Teeming as it was with thousands of men, horses, and smoking cookfires. To the west of the tents, there wound three tree line there wound the tree line Jeet River. Half a mile to the east was a second, smaller camp, like an island floating close off the shore of its mother continent, where the Urgles, led by Nargarjvag, resided. Ranging for several miles around the perimeter of the Varden were numerous groups of horsemen. Some were riding patrol, others were banner-carrying messengers, and others were raiding parties either setting out or on or returning from a mission. Two of the patrols spotted Aragon and Arya, and after sounding signal horns, galloped toward them with all possible speed. A broad smile stretched Aragon's face, and he laughed relieved. <laughs> we made it! he exclaimed. Murtag, Thord, hundreds of soldiers, Galvatorx's pet magicians, the Rosic, none of them could catch us. How's that for taunting the king? This'll tweak his beard for sure when he hears of it. He'll be twice as dangerous then, warned Arya. I know, he said, grinning even wider. Maybe he'll get so angry he'll forget to pay his troops and they'll all throw away their uniforms and join the Varden. You're in a fine fettle today, and why shouldn't I be, he demanded. Bouncing on the tips of his toes, he opened his mind as wide as he could and gathering his strength, shouted at, Safira! Sending the thought flying over the countryside like a spear. A response was not long in coming. Aragon! They embraced with their minds, smothering each other with warm waves of love, joy, and concern. They exchanged memories of their time apart, and Saphir comforted Aragon over the soldiers he had killed, drawing off the pain and anger that had accumulated within him since the incident. He smiled. With Saphir so close, everything, everything seemed right in the world. I missed you, he said, and I you, little one. Then she sent him an image of the soldiers he and Ari had fought and said, Without fail, every time I leave you, you get yourself into trouble. Every time, I hate it so much as you turn tail on you, for fear you will be locked in mortal combat the moment I take my eyes off you. Well, be fair, I've gotten into plenty of trouble when I'm with you. It's not something that just happens when I'm alone. We seem to, do, to be lodestones for unexpected events. No, you are a lodestone for unexpected events, she sniffed. Nothing out of the ordinary ever occurs to me when I'm by myself, but you attract duels, ambushes, immortal enemies, obscure creatures such as the Razak, long-lost family members, and mysterious acts of magic as if they were starving weasels. And you are a rabbit that wandered into their den. What about the time you spent as Galbatorx's possession? Was that an ordinary event? I had not hatched yet, she said. You cannot count that. The difference between you and me is that this thing happens to you, whereas I cause things to happen. Well, maybe that's just because I'm still learning. Give me a few years and I'll be as good as Brahm at getting things done, huh? You can't say I didn't seize the initial, you know, initiative with Salone. Mm-hmm. We still have to talk about that. If you ever surprise me like that again, I will pin you on the ground and lick you from head to toe. Aragon shivered. Her tongue was covered with hooked barbs and that could strip from hair to hide and meet off a deer with a single swipe. I know, but I wasn't sure myself whether I was going to kill Sloane or let him go free until I was standing in front of him. Besides, if I told you I was going to stay behind, you would have insisted on stopping me. He sensed a faint growl as it rumbled through her. She said, You should have trusted me to do the right thing. If we cannot talk openly... How are we supposed to function as dragon and rider? Would doing the right thing have involved taking me from Hellgrind regardless of my wishes? Well, it might not have, she said with a hint of defensiveness. He smiled. Well, you're right, though. I should have discussed my plan with you. I'm sorry. From now on, 
I promise I will consult with you before I do anything you don't expect. Is that acceptable? Only if it involves weapons, magic kings, or family members, she said. Or flowers? Or flowers, she agreed. I don't know if you decided to eat some bread and cheese in the middle of the night. Well, unless a man with a very long knife is waiting for me outside of my tent. If you cannot defeat a single man with a very long knife, you would be a poor excuse for a rider indeed. Well, not to mention dead. Well... By your own argument, you should take comfort in the fact that I, while I may attract more trouble than you, or most people, I am perfectly capable of escaping from situations that would kill most anyone else. Even the greatest warriors can fall prey to bad luck, she said. Remember the dwarf king Kaga, who was killed by a novice swordsman. Swords dwarf? When he tripped on a rock. You should always remain cautious, for no matter your skills, you cannot anticipate and prevent every misfortune fate directs your way. Yeah, agreed. Now, can we please abandon such weighty conversation? I have become thoroughly exhausted with the thoughts of fate, destiny, justice and other equally gloomy topics over the past few days. As far as I'm concerned, philosophic questioning is just as likely to make you confused and depressed as it is to improve your condition. Swiveling his head, Aragon surveyed the plain and sky, searching for the distinctive blue glitter of Saphira's scales. Where are you? I can feel you're nearby, but I can't see you. Right above you. With a bugle of joy, Saphira dove out of the belly of a cloud several thousand feet overhead, spiraling toward the ground with her wings tucked close to her body. Opening her fearsome jaws, she released a billow of fire which steamed back over her head and neck like a burning mane. Aragon laughed and held his arms outstretched to her. The, horse of the horses of the patrol galloping toward him and Arya shied away at the sight and sound of Saphira and bolted in the opposite direction while their riders frantically tried to rein them in. I had hoped we would enter the camp without attracting undue attention, Arya said, but I suppose I should have realized we could not be unobtrusive with Saphira around. A dragon is hard to ignore. I heard that, said Saphira, spreading her wings and landing with a thunderous crash. Her massive thighs and shoulders rippled as she absorbed the force of the impact. A blast of air struck Aragon's face and the earth shuddered underneath him. He flexed his knees to maintain his balance. Folding her wings so they lay flat upon her back, she said, I can be stealthy if I want. Then she cocked her head and blinked, the tip of her tail whipping from side to side. But I don't want to be stealthy today. Today I am a dragon, not a frightened pigeon trying to avoid being seen by a hunting falcon. When are you not a dragon? asked Aragon as he ran toward her. Light as a feather, he leaped from her left foreleg to her shoulder and thence to the hollow of the base of her neck that was the usual seat. Settling into one place, he put his hand on either side of the warm neck, feeling the rise and fall of her banded muscles as she breathed. He smiled again. This is where I belong. Here with you. His legs vibrated as Saphira hummed with satisfaction, her deep rumbling following a strange, subtle melody he did not recognize. Greetings, Saphira, said Arya, and twisted her hand over her chest in the elves' gesture of respect. Crouching low and bending her long neck, Saphira touched Arya upon the brow with the tip of her snout, as she had when she blessed Elva in Farthendur, and said, Greetings, Athakona. Welcome, and may the wind rise under your wings. She spoke to Arya with the same tone of affection that, until then, she had reserved for Aragon, as if she now considered Arya part of their small family and worthy of the same regard and intimacy as, she sh as they shared. Her gesture surprised Aragon, but after an initial flare of jealousy, he approved. Saphira continued speaking. I am grateful to you for helping Aragon to return without harm. If he had been captured, I do not know what I would have done. Your gratitude means much to me, said Arya and bowed. As for what you would have done if Galptorx had seized Aragon, why? You would have rescued him, and I would have accompanied you even if it was to Urbane itself. Yes, I like to think I would have rescued you, a Aragon, said Saphira, turning her neck to look at him. But I worry that I would have surrendered to the Empire in order to save you, no matter the consequences for Alagazia. Then she shook her head and kneaded the soil with her claws. 
Now, these are pointless meanderings. You're here and safe, and that is the true shape of the world. To while away the day contemplating evils that might have been is to poison the happiness we already have. At that moment, a patrol galloped toward them, and halting 30 yards away because of their nervous horses, asked if they might escort the three to Naswada. One of the men dismounted and gave his steed to Arya, and then as a group, they advanced towards the Sea of Tents to the southwest. Sapphira set the pace, a leisurely crawl that allowed her and Aragorn to enjoy the pleasure of each other's company before they immersed themselves in the noise and chaos that were sure to assault them once they neared the camp. Aragorn inquired after Roran and Katrina, then said, Have you been eating enough fireweed? Your breath seems stronger than usual. Well, of course I have. You'll notice because you have been gone for many days. I smell exactly as a dragon should smell and I'll thank you not to make disparaging comments about it unless you want me to drop you on your head. Besides, you humans have nothing to brag about. Sweaty, greasy, pungent things that you are. The only creatures in this wild as smelly as humans are male goats and hibernating bears. Compared to you, the scent of a dragon is a perfume as delightful as a meadow of mountain flowers. Oh, come on! Don't exaggerate! Although... He said, wrinkling his nose. Since the Agate Blodron, I have noticed that humans tend to be rather smelly. But you can't lump me in with the rest, for I'm no longer entirely human. Well, perhaps not, but you still need a bath. As they crossed the plain, more and more men congregated, congregated around Aragon and Saphir, providing them with a holy, unnecessary, but very impressive honor guard. After so long spent in the wilds of Algazi, the dense press of bodies, the cacophony of high, excited voices, the storm of unguarded thoughts and emotions, and the confused motion of flailing arms and prancing horses were rather overwhelming for Aragon. He retreated deep within himself, where the discordant mental chorus was no louder than the distant thunder of crashing waves. Even through the layers of barriers, he sensed the approach of twelve elves running in formation from the other side of the camp, swift and lean as yellow-eyed mountain cats. Wanting to make a favorable impression, Arion combed his hair with his fingers and squared his shoulders, but he also tightened the armor around his consciousness so that no one but Saphir could hear his thoughts. The elves had come to protect him and Saphir, but ultimately their allegiance belonged to Queen Islanzadi. While he was grateful for their presence, he doubted their inherent politeness would allow them to eavesdrop on him. He did not want to provide the Queen of the Elves with any opportunity to learn the secrets of the Varden, nor to gain a hold over him. If she could wrest him away from Naswada, he knew she would. On the whole, the Elves do not trust humans, not that after Galvatorx's betrayal and for that and other reasons, he was sure Islan Zadi would prefer to have him and Saphir under her direct command. And of the potentates he had met, he trusted Islan Zadi the least. She was too imperious and too erratic. The twelve elves halted before Saphira. They bowed and twisted their heads as Ari had done, and one by one introduced themselves to Aragon with the initial phrase of the elves' traditional greeting, to which he replied with the appropriate lines. Then the lead elf, a tall, handsome male with glossy blue-black fur covering his entire body, proclaimed the purpose of their mission to everyone within earshot and formally asked Aragon and Saphira if the Twelve might assume their duties. You may, said Aragon. You may, said Saphira. Then Aragon asked, Bloodgarm Voder, did I perchance see you at the Agate Bloodrun? For he remembered watching an elf with a similar pelt gambling among the trees during the festivities. Bloodgarm smiled, exposing the fangs of an animal. I believe you met my cousin, Leotha. We share a most striking family resemblance, although her fur is brown and flecked, whereas mine is dark blue. I would have sworn it was you. Unfortunately, I was otherwise engaged at the time and was unable to attend the celebration. Perhaps I shall have the opportunity when next the occasion occurs, a hundred years from now. Would you not agree? said Sephira to Aragon, that he has a pleasant aroma? Aragon sniffed the air. I don't smell anything. I would if there was a, anything to smell. That's odd. She provided him with then with a range of odors she had detected, 
and at once he realized what she meant. Bloodyarm's musk surrounded him like a cloud, thick and heady, a warm, smoky scent that contained hints of crushed juniper berries, and that set Sephira's nostrils to tingling. All of the women in the Varden seem to have fallen in love with him, she said. They stalk him wherever he goes, desperate to talk with him, but too shy to utter as much as a squeak when he looks at them. Well, maybe only they can smell him? He cast a concerned gl concern glance at Arya. She doesn't seem affected to you, does she? She has protection against magical influences. Well, I hope so. Do you think we should be put a stop to blood Bloodgarm? What he's doing is a sneaky, underhanded way of gaining a woman's heart. Is it any more underhanded than adorning yourself with fine clothes to catch the eye of your beloved? Bloodgarm has take, not taken advantage of the women who are fascinated by him, and it seems impro improbable that he would have to compose the notes of his scent to appeal specifically to human women. Rather, I would guess it's an unintended consequence, and that he created it to serve another purpose altogether. Unless he discards all semblance of decency, I think we should refrain from interfering. Well, what about Neswada? Is she vulnerable to his charms? Neswada is wise and wary. She had Triana place a ward around her that protects her against Bloodgarm's influence. Well, that's good. When they arrived at the tents, the crowd swelled in size until half the Varden appeared to be gathered around Saphira. Aragon raised his hand in response as people shouted, Arjetlam! And Shade Slayer! And he heard others say, Where have you been, Shade Slayer? Tell us of your adventures! A fair number referred to him as the Bane of the Razak, which he found so immensely satisfying, he repeated the phrase four times to himself under his breath. People also shouted blessings upon his health and Saphira's too, and invitations to dine and offers of gold and jewelry and piteous requests for aid. Would he please heal a son who had been born blind, or would he remove a growth that was killing a man's wife, or would he fix a horse's broken leg or a pair of bent sword? For as the man bellowed, it was my grandfather's! Twice, a woman's voice cried out, Shade Slayer, will you marry me? And while he looked, he was unable to identify the source. Throughout the commotion, the twelve elves hovered close. The knowledge that they were watching for that which he could not see and listening for that which he could not hear was a comfort to Aragon and allowed him to interact with the masked Varden with an ease that had escaped him in the past. Then, from between the curving rows of woolen tents, the former villagers of Carverhall began to appear, Dismounting, Aragorn walked among the friends and acquaintances of his childhood, shaking his hands, slapping shoulders, and laughing at jokes that would be incomprehensible to anyone who had not grown up around Carvajal. Horst was there, and Aragorn grasped the smith's brawny forearm. Welcome back, Aragorn. Well done. We're in your debt for avenging us on the monster that drove us from our homes. I'm glad to see you are still in one piece, huh? The Razak would have been had to move a sight faster to chop any parts off me, said Aragon. Then he found himself greeting horse sons, Albrecht and Baldor, and then Loring the Shoemaker and his three sons, Terra and Morn, who had owned Carvajal's tavern, Fisk, Felda, Kalitha, Delwyn, and Lena, and then fierce-eyed Burgett, who said, I thank you, Aragon, son of Nun. I thank you for ensuring that the creatures who ate my husband were properly punished. My hearth is yours now and forever. Before Aragorn could respond, the crown swept him apart. Son of none, he thought. Ha, I have a father and everyone hates him. Then, to his delight, Rorin shouldered his way out of the throng, Katrina beside him. He and Rorin embraced, and Rorin growled, That was a fool thing to do, staying behind. I ought to knock your block off for abandoning us like that. Next time, give me advice, adv not, not advice, give me advance warning before you traipse off on your, on your own. It's getting to be a habit with you, and you should have seen how upset Saphira was on the flight back. Aragorn put a hand on Saphira's left foreleg and said, I'm sorry. I could not tell you beforehand that I planned to stay, but I did not realize it was necessary until the very last moment. And why was it exactly you remained in those foul caverns? Well, because there was something I had to investigate. When he failed to expand upon his answer, Roran's broad face hardened and for a moment Aragorn feared he would insist upon a more satisfactory explanation. But then, Roran said, Well, what hope has an ordinary man like myself of understanding the whys and wherefores of a dragon rider? Even if he's my cousin, all that matters is that you helped free Katrina and you are now here and safe and sound. 
He craned his neck as if he were trying to see what lay on top of Safira. Then he looked at Arya, who was several yards behind them, and said, You lost my staff. I crossed the entire breadth of Algazi with that staff. Couldn't you manage to hold on to it for more than a few days? It went to a man who needed it more than I, said Aragon. Oh, stop nipping at him, Katrina said to Roran, and after a moment's hesitation, she hugged Aragon. He is really very glad to see you, you know. He just had a difficult finding the words to say it. With a sheepish, sheepish grin, Roran shrugged. She's right about me, as always. The two of them exchanged a loving glance. Aragon studied Katrina closely. Her copper hair had regained its original luster, and for the most part, the marks left by her ordeal had faded away, although she was still thinner and paler than normal. Moving closer to him so none of the Varden clustered around them could overhear, she said, I never thought I would owe you so much, Aragon, that we would owe you so much. Since the fear brought us here, I have learned what you risked to rescue me, and I'm most grateful. If I'd spent another week in Hellgrind, it would have been killed me or stripped me of reason, which is a living death. For saving me from that fate and for repairing Roran's shoulder, you have my utmost thanks. But more than that, you have my thanks for bringing the two of us back together again. If not for you, we never would have been reunited. Somehow, I think Roran would have found a way to extricate you from Hellgrind, even without me, commented Aragon. He has a silver tongue when roused. He would have convinced another spellcaster to help him, Angel the Herbalist, perhaps, and he would have succeeded all the same. Angel the Herbalist? scoffed Roran. That prattling girl who would have been no match to the Razak? You would be surprised. She's more than she appears or sounds, said Aragon. Then Aragon dared to do something that he never would have attempted when he was living in Palancar Valley, but that he felt was appropriate in his role as a writer. He kissed Katrina upon her brow and then kissed Roran upon his and said, Roran, you are as a brother to me, and Katrina, you are as a sister to me. If ever you are in trouble, send for me, and whether you need Aragon the farmer or Aragon the rider, everything I am shall be at your disposal. And likewise, said Roran, if ever you are in trouble, you have but to send for us, and we shall rush to your aid. Aragon nodded, acknowledging his offer, and refrained from mentioning that the troubles he was most likely to encounter would not be of a sort either of them could assist him with. He griped, he gripped them both by the shoulders and said, May you live long, may you always be together and happy, and may you have many children. Katrina's smile faltered for a moment, and Aragon wondered at that. At Saphira's urging, they resumed walking toward Aswa's red pavilion in the center of the encampment. In due time... They and the host of Cheering Varden arrived at its threshold, where Naswada stood waiting, King Orin to her left, and scores of nobles and other notable characters behind a double row of guards on either side. Naswada was garbed in green silk, a dress that shimmered in the sun like the feathers of, a, of the breast of a hummingbird in bright contrast to the sable shade of her skin. The sleeves of the dress ended in lace ruffs at her elbows. White linen bandages covered the rest of her arms to her narrow wrists. Of all the men and women assembled before her, she was the most distinguished, like an emerald resting on a bed of brown autumn leaves. Only Sephira could compete with the brilliance of her appearance. Aragon and Arya presented themselves to Naswada, then to King Orin. Naswada gave them formal welcome on, on behalf of the Varden and praised them for their bravery. She finished by saying, I, Galvatorix, may have a rider and dragon who fight for him even as Aragon and Sephira fight for us. He may have an army so large that it darkens the land, and he may be adept at strange and terrible magics, abominations of the spellcaster's art. But for all his wicked power, he cannot stop Aragorn and Saphira from invading his realm and killing four of his most favored servants, nor Aragorn from crossing the empire with impunity. The pretender's arm has grown weak indeed when he cannot defend his borders, nor protect his foul agents within their hidden fortress. Amid the Varden's enthusiastic cheering, Aragon allowed himself a secret smile at how well Naswada played upon their emotions, inspiring confidence, loyalty, and high spirits in spite of a reality that was far less optimistic than she portrayed. She did not lie to them. To his knowledge, she did not lie, not even when dealing with the Council of Elders or others of their political rivals. What she did was report the truths that best supported her position and her arguments. In that regard... He thought she was like the elves. When the Varden's outpouring of excitement had subsided, 
King Orin greeted Aragorn and Arya as in the swat ahead. His delivery was stayed, uh, com stayed compared with hers, and while the crowd listened politely and plotted afterwards, it was obvious to Aragorn that however much the people respected Orin, they did not love him as they loved Nuswata, nor could he fire their imagination as Nuswata fired it. The smooth-faced king was gifted with a superior intellect, but his personality was too rarefied, too eccentric, and too subdued for him to be re respectable, or for the desperate hopes of the humans that opposed Galvatorix. If we overthrow Galvatorix, Aragorn said to, to, to Sphira, Orin should not replace him in Urbane. He would not be able to unite the land as Naswat has reunited the Varden. Agreed, said Sephira. At length, King Orin concluded. Naswata whispered to Aragorn, Now it's your turn to address those who have assembled to catch a glimpse of what the renowned dragon rider can say. Her eyes twinkled with, surprise, with suppressed merriment. What, me? It's expected. Then Aragorn turned and faced the multitude, his tongue dry as sand. His mind was blank, and for a handful of panic-stricken seconds, he thought the use of language would continue to elude him, and he would embrace himself in front of the, and he would embarrass himself in front of the entire Varden. Somewhere, a horse nickered, but otherwise the camp seemed frightfully quiet. It was Sephira who broke his paralysis by nudging his elbow with her snout and saying, Tell them you are honored to have their support and how happy you are to be back among them. With her encouragement, he managed to find a few fumbling words, and then soon, as it was acceptable, he bowed and retreated a step. Forcing a smile while the Varden clapped and cheered the beat and beat their swords against their shields, he exclaimed, That was horrible. I would rather fight a shade than do that again. Really, it, it's not that hard, Aragorn. Yeah, it is! A puff of smoke drifted up from her nostrils as, the, as she snorted with amusement. A fine dragon rider you are, afraid of talking to a large group? If only Galbatorix knew he could have you at his mercy if he but asked you to make a speech to his troops. It's not funny, he grumbled, but she still continued to chuckle. To answer a king. After Aragon gave his address to the Varden, Naswata gestured and Jormunder leaped to her side. Have everyone here return to their posts. If we are attacked now, we will be overwhelmed. Yes, my lady. Beckoning to Aragorn and Arya, Naswata placed her left hand on King Orin's arm, and with him entered the pavilion. What about you? Aragorn asked Sephira as he followed. Then he stepped inside the pavilion and saw that a panel at the back had been rolled up and tied the wooden frame above so that Sephira might insert her head and participate in the goings-on. He had to wait for a moment before her glittering head and neck swung into view around the edge of the opening, darkening the interior as she settled into place. Purple flecks of light adorned the walls, projecting by, projected by her blue scales on the red fabric. Aragon examined the rest of the tent. It was barren compared with when he had last visited, a result of the destruction Sephira had caused when she crawled into the pavilion to see Aragon in the Swata's mirror. With only four pieces of furniture, the tent was austere even by military standards. There was the polished high-backed chair where Naswata was sitting, King Orn standing next to her, the self-same mirror, which was mounted at the eye level on a carved brass pole, a folding chair, and a low table strewn with maps and other documents of import. An intricately knotted dwarf rug covered the ground. Besides Arya and himself, a score of people were already gathered before Naswata. They were all looking at him. Among them he recognized Narhim, the current commander of the dwarf troops, Triana and other spellcasters from Duvrangergata, Sabre Umurth, and the rest of the Council of Elders, save for Jormunder, and random assortments of nobles and functionaries from King Orin's court. Those who were strangers to him, he assumed, also held positions of distinction in one of the many factions that made up the Varden's army. Six of Naswata's guards were present, two staged, stationed by the entrance and four behind Naswata. An Aragorn detected the convoluted pattern of Elva's dark and twisted thoughts from where the witch child was hidden at the far end of the pavilion. Aragorn, said Naswata, you have not met we you you have not met before, but let me introduce Segabato no Inapshuna Fadawar, a chief of the Inapshuna tribe. He is a brave man. For the next hour, Aragorn endured what seemed like an endless procession of introductions, congratulations, and questions that he could not answer forthrightly without revealing secrets that were better left unsaid. When all the guests had conversed with him, Naswata bade them take their leave. 
As they filed out of the pavilion, she clapped her hands and the guards outside ushered in the second group, and then, when the second group had enjoyed the dubious fruits of their visitation with him, a third. Aragon smiled the whole time. He shook hand after hand. He exchanged meaningless pleasantries and drove the memories, the plethora of names and titles that besieged him, and otherwise acted with perfect civility the role he was expected to play. He knew that they honored him not because he was their friend, but because of the chance of victory he embodied for the free peoples of Algazia. Because of his power and because of what they hoped to gain by him, in his heart he howled with, with, with frustration and longed to break free of the stifling constraints of good manners and polite conduct and to climb on Saphira and fly away to somewhere peaceful. The one part of the process Aragorn enjoyed was watching how the supplicants reacted to the two Urgles who loomed behind Naswada's chair. Some pretended to ignore the horned warriors, although from the quickness of their emotions and the shrill tones of their voices, Aragorn could tell that the creatures unnerved them, while others glared at the Urgles and kept their hands in the pommels of their swords or daggers, and still others affected a false bravado and belittled the Urgles' notorious strength and boasted of their own. Only a few people truly seemed unaffected by the sight of the Urgles. Foremost among them was Naswada, but their number also included King Orin, Triana, and an Earl who had, who had said he had seen more than his dragon lay waste to entire town when he had been but a boy. When Aragorn could bear no more, Saphira swelled her chest and released a low, humming growl, so deep that it shook the mirror of it off its frame. The pavilion became as, as silent as a tomb. Her growl was not overtly threatening, but it captured everyone's attention and proclaimed her impatience with the proceedings. None of the guests were foolish enough to test her for her forbearance. When hurried excuses, with hurried excuses, they gathered their things and filed out of the pavilion, quickening their pace. When Saphira tapped the tips of her claws against the ground, Naswata sighed at the entrance flap swung closed behind the last visitor. Thank you, Saphira. I'm sorry that I had to subject you to the misery of public presentation, Aragon. But as I am sure you are aware, you op occupy an exalted position among the Varden, and I cannot keep you to myself any more. You belong to the people now. They demand that you recognize them, and that you give them what they consider their rightful share of your time. Neither you nor Orn, I can refuse the wishes of the crowd. Even Galvatorx and his dark-seated power of Urabane fears the fickle crowd, although he may deny it to everyone, including himself. With the guests departed, King Orin abandoned the guise of, a, of royal decorum. His stern expression relaxed into one of more human relief, irritation, and ferocious curiosity. Rolling his shoulders beneath his stiff robes, he looked at Naswada and said, I do not think we require Nighthawks to wait on us any longer. Agreed. Naswada clapped her hands, dismissing the six guards from the inside of the tent. Dragging the spare chair over to Naswada, King Orin seated himself in a tangle of sprawling limbs and billowing fabric. Now, he said, switching his gaze between Aragorn and Arya, let us have a full account of your doings, Aragorn Shadeslayer. I have heard only vague explanations for why you choose to lay at Hellgrind, and I have had my fill of evasions and deceptive answers. I am determined to know the truth of the matter, so I warn you. Do not attempt to conceal what exact what actually transpired while you were in the Empire. Until I am satisfied you have told me everything there is to tell, none of us shall so much as step outside of this tent. Her voice cold, and the Swata said, You assume too much, Your Majesty. You do not have the authority to bind me in place, nor Aragon, who is my vassal, nor Saphira, nor Arya, who answers to no mortal lord, but rather to one more powerful than the two of us combined. Nor do we have the authority to bind you. The five of us are as close to equals as any of us likely to find in Algazia. You would do well to remember that. King Orin's response was equally flinty. Do I exceed the bounds of my sovereignty? Well, perhaps I do. You are right. I have no hold over you, however. If we are equals, I have yet to see evidence of it in your treatment of me. Aragon answers to you and only you. By the trial of the Long Knives, you have gained dominion over the wandering tribes, many of which I have long counted among my subjects. And you command, as you will both the Varden and the men of Serda, who have long served my family with bravery and determination beyond that of ordinary men. It was you yourself who asked me to orchestrate this campaign, said this one. I have not deposed you. Ah, uh, it was my request you who, that you assumed command of our disparate forces. I am not ashamed to admit 
you have had more experience and success than I am in waging war. Our prospects are too precarious for you, me, or any of us to indulge in false pride. However, since you are investiture, you seem to have forgotten that I'm still the king of Surda, and we ha of the Langfield family can trace our line back to Thane Brand, the ring giver himself, who succeeded old mad Palancar, and who was the first of our race to sit on the throne in what is now called Urabane. Considering our heritage and the assistance of the House of Langfield has rendered you in this cause, it is insulting of you to ignore the rights of my office. You act as if you, yours was the only verdict of, of, of the moment and the opinions of others are of no account to be trampled over in pursuit of whatever goal you have already determined is best for the portion of free humanity that is fortunate enough to have you as their leader. You negotiate treaties and alliances such as that with the Urgles of your own initiative and expect me and others to abide by your decisions as if you speak for all of us. You arrange preemptive visits of state such as that of Bloodgarn Boulder and do not trouble to alert me of his arrival nor wait for me to join you so we might greet his embassy together as equals. And when I have the temerity to ask why Aragon, the man who has, whose very existence is the reason I have staked my, country, uh, staked my country in this venture, when I have the temerity to ask why this is all important, this all important person is elected to endanger the lives of certains and those of every creature who opposes Galvatorx by tearing in the midst of our enemies, how is it you respond by treating me as if I were no more than an overzealous, over-inquisitive underling whose childish concerns distracted you from more pressing matters? I will not have it, I tell you. If you cannot bring yourself to respect my station and to accept a fair division of responsibility as two allies ought to, then it is my opinion that you are unfit to command a coalition such as ours, and I shall set myself against you however I may. What a long-winded fellow, Saphir observed. Alarmed by the direction of the conversation had taken, Aragon said, What should I do? I'm not intended to tell anyone else about Sloane except for Niswada. The fewer people who know he's alive, the better. A flickering sea blue shimmer ran from the base of Saphir's head to the crest of her shoulders as the tips of the sharp diamond shaped scales along the sides of her neck rose a fraction of an inch from the underlying skin. The jagged layers of projecting scales gave her a fierce, ruffled appearance. I cannot tell you what is best, Aragon, and this you must rely upon your own judgment. Listen closely to what your heart says, and perhaps. It will become clear how to win free of these treacherous downdrafts. In response to King Orin's sally, Niswata clasped her hands in her lap, her bandages startlingly wide against the green of her dress, and in a calm, even voice said, If I have slighted you, sire, then it was due to my own hasty carelessness and not to any desire on my part to diminish you or your house. Please forgive my lapses. They shall not happen again. That I promise you. As you have pointed out, I have but recently ascended to this post, and I have yet to master all of the accompanying, ni accompanying niceties. Orin inclined his head in a cool but gracious acceptance of her words. As for Aragon and his activities in the Empire, I could not have provided you with specific details, for I have no further intelligence myself. It was not, as I am sure you can appreciate, a situation that I wish to advertise. Well, no, of course not. Therefore, it seems to me that the swiftest cure for the dispute that afflicts us is to allow Aragon to lay bare the facts of his trip that we may apprehend the full scope of this event and render judgment upon it. Of its own, that is not a cure, said King Orin, but it is the beginning of a cure, and I will gladly listen. Then let us not tarry longer, said Niswata. Let us begin this beginning and have done with our suspense. Aragon, it is time for your tale. When the Swada and the others gazing at him with wondering eyes, Aragon made his choice. Lifting his chin, he said, What I tell you, I tell you in confidence. I know I cannot expect either of you, King or nor you, Lady Niswada, to swear that you will keep the secret bound within your hearts from now until the day you die, but I beg you to act as if you had. It could cause a great deal of grief if this knowledge were to be whispered to the wrong ears. A king does not remain king for long unless he appreciates the value of silence, said Orin. Without further ado, Aragon described everything that had happened to him in Hellgrind, and in the days that had followed afterward. 
Ari explained how she had gone about locating Aragon that then corroborated his account of their travels by providing several facts and observations of her own. When they had both said their fill, the pavilion was quiet as Orn and Aswata sat motionless upon their chairs. Aragon felt as if he were a child again, waiting for Garrow to tell him what his punishment would be for doing something foolish on their, on their farm. Orin and Naswata remained lost deep in reflection for several minutes. Then Naswata smoothed the front of her dress and said, King Orin may be of a different opinion, and if so, I look forward to hearing his reasons, but for my part, I believe that you did the right thing, Aragon. As do I, said Orin, surprising them all. You, you do? exclaimed Aragon. He hesitated. I, I don't mean to sound impertinent, for I'm glad you approve, but I didn't expect you to look kindly upon my decision to spare Sloane's life, if I may ask, um, why? King Orn interrupted, why do we approve? The rule of law must be upheld. If you had appointed yourself Sloane's executioner, Aragon, you would have taken for yourself the power that Naswada and I wield. For he who has the audacity to determine who should live and who should die no longer serves the law, but dictates the law. And whoever benevolent, however benevolent you might be, that would be no good thing for our species. Naswada and I, at least, answer to the one lord even kings must kneel before. We answer to Angvard in his realm of eternal twilight. We answer to the gray man in his gray house, death. We could be the worst tyrants in the world of history, and given enough time, Angvard would bring us to heel. But not you. Humans are a short-lived race, and we should not be governed by one of the undying. We do not need another Galvatorix. A strange laugh escaped from Orin then, and his mouth twisted in a humorous smile. Do you understand, Aragon? You... <laughs> you are so dangerous. We are forced to acknowledge the danger to your face, and hope that you are the one of the few people able to resist the lure of power. King Orin laced his fingers together underneath his chin and gazed at the fold in his robes. I have said more than I intended, so, for all those reasons and the others besides, I agree with Naswata. You are right to stay your hand when you discovered this Sloan and Hellgrind. As inconvenient as this episode has been, it would have been far worse, and for you as well, if you had killed to please yourself and not in self-defense or in service of others. Naswata nodded. That was well spoken. Throughout, Arya listened to it with the inscrutable expression. Whatever her own thoughts on the matter were, she did not divulge them. Orin and Naswata pressed Aragon with a number of questions about the oaths he had laid upon Sloane, as well as queries about the remainder of his trip. The interrogation continued for so long, Naswata had a tray of cooled cider, fruit, and meat pies brought into the pavilion, along with haunch of a steer for Saphira. Naswada and Orin had sent an ample opportunity to eat between questions. However, they kept Aragon so busy talking, he managed to consume only two bites of fruit and a few sips of cider to wet his throat. At long last, King Orin bade them farewell and departed to review the statue status of the cavalry. Arya left a minute later, explaining that she needed to report to Queen Islanzadi in two. As she said, Heat a tub of water, wash the sand from my skin, and return my features to their usual shape. I do not feel myself with the tips of my ears missing, my eyes round and level, and the bones of my face in the wrong places. When she was alone with Aragon and Saphira, Naswata sighed and leaned her head against the back of her chair. Aragon was shocked by how tired she appeared. Gone were her pre previous vitality and strength of presence. Gone was the fire from her eyes. She had, he realized, been pretending to be stronger than she was in order to avoid tempting her enemies and demoralizing the Varden with the spectacle of her weakness. Are you... are you ill? he asked. She nodded toward her arms. Not exactly. It's taking me longer to recuperate than I anticipated. Some days are worse than others. If you want, I can... No, thank you, but no. Do not tempt me. One rule of the trial of the long knives is that you must allow your wounds to heal at their own pace. Without magic. Otherwise, the contestants will not have endured the, the full measure of pain from their cuts. Well, that's barbaric! A slow smile touched her lips. Maybe so, but it is what it is, and it would not fail. And I and it will not fail so late in the trial merely because I could not withstand a bit of, a, of an ache. What if your wound festers? Then they fester, and I shall pay the price for my mistake. But I doubt they will. While Angela ministers to me, she has an amazing storehouse of knowledge where medicinal plants are concerned. 
I half believe she could tell you the true name of every species of grass on the plains east of here merely by feeling their leaves. Sephiria, who had been so still she appeared asleep, now yawned, nearly touching the floor and the ceiling with the tips of her open jaws, and shook her head and neck, sending the flecks of light reflecting by her scales spinning about the tents with dizzying speed. Straightening in her seat, Naswata said, I'm sorry. I know this has been tedious. You have both been very patient. Thank you. Aragon knelt and placed his right hand over hers. You do not need to worry about me, Naswata. I know my duty. I've never aspired a rule that is not my destiny. And if I'm ever offered the chance to sit upon the throne, I shall refuse and see that it goes to someone who is better suited than I to lead our race. You are a good person, Aragon, murmured Naswata, and pressed his hand between hers. Then she chuckled. What with you, Rorn, and Murtag, it seemed to, I spe seem to spend most of my time worrying about members of your family. Aragon bridled at the statement, Murtag is not family of mine. Of course, forgive me, but still, you must admit it's startling how much brother the, the three of you, brothers the three of you have caused. Sorry, I'm tired. You must admit it's startling how much bother the three of you have caused, both the Empire and the Varden. That's a talent of ours, joked Aragon. It runs in their blood, said Sephira. Wherever they go, they get themselves entangled in the worst danger possible. She nudged Aragon in the arm, especially this one. What else can you expect of people from Palancar Valley, descendants of all of a mad king? But not mad themselves, said Naswata. At least I don't think so. It's hard to tell at times. She laughed. If you, Rorn, and Murtag were locked in the same cell, I'm not sure you would survive. Aragon laughed as well. Rorn, he's not about to let a little thing like death stand between him and Katrina. Naswata's smile became slightly strained. No, I suppose he wouldn't at that. For a score of a heartbeat, she was silent. Then, goodness me, how selfish I am. The day is almost gone, and here I am detaining you merely so I can enjoy a minute or two of idle conversation. No, 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 the, the pleasure is all mine. Yes, but there are better places than this for talk among friends. After what you have been through, I expect you would like a wash, a change, and a hearty meal, right? You must be famished. Aragon glanced at the apple he still had and regretfully concluded that it would be impolite to continue eating it when his audience with Naswata was drawing to a close. Naswata caught his look and said, Your face answers for you, Shade Slayer. You have the guise of a winter-starving wolf. Well, I shall not torment you any longer. Go, and bathe and garb yourself in your finest tunic. When you are presentable, I will be most pleased if you consent to join me for the evening meal. Understand, you would not be my only guest for the affairs of the Varden demand my constant attention, but you would brighten the proceedings considerably for me if you chose to attend. Aragon fought back a grimace at the thought of having to spend hours more pairing verbal thrusts for those who sought to use him for their own advantage or to satisfy the curiosity about riders and dragons. Still, Naswata was not to be denied, so he bowed and agreed to her request. And that, my friends, is where we'll conclude this portion of Brissinger. To everyone that is in here with me, listening in Discord. Thank you so very much. Everyone that is listening to this after the, fa after the fact, thank you so much for checking out these videos. Thank you for subscribing to the channel and for all of the wonderful comments you've all been leaving. I do plan on adding some more books to the channel soon. Again, if you'd like to catch us li live on Twitch, we do a lot of silly things like sing songs and play fantasy RPGs, and we're currently going through Kingdom Hearts 2. That's us live on Sunday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 Mountain Standard, 7 Central, and 8 Eastern, and on Mondays here on our Discord, you can come and listen to these live where there's a little bit of editing that goes into these videos so that we can joke a little amongst ourselves. Thank you so much for being here. Take care of yourselves, and have a wonderful time zone wherever you are. Thank you so much.